has been canceled out. He has used everything in her life. Today, she is the founder of FEW, the Fellowship of Extraordinary Women, where she, she teaches women to love and care for each other and challenge and help each other grow. She is a life coach. She is a speaker. She travels all over speaking to women. She, um, she's a publisher and an author. And Rhea and Kim's books are um, in the back. And she impacts women's lives in an amazing way. And I couldn't be more proud of her. And I know that um, she has something special to share with you today. Okay. That's so not fair. So that is rude because I have to get up here and talk and I just want to go in the corner and blubber for a minute, but I can't afford to do that right now because I have a message for you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Linda was not lying. I, I was for a season a single mom of um, 11, actually only 10 because one of them had was 19 and moved out. So. Before you feel too bad for me, it was only 10. <laughs> and, uh, and then during that season, it was just a get on the floor, get on your face. Every minute you have a minute, which isn't very often, and get with your husband, Jesus. And that season, although a blur and one of the hardest seasons of my life was one of the most precious and foundational seasons with the Lord. And I don't, I didn't plan on saying that, but somebody in the room needs to hear that. That that thing that is absolutely impossible, improbable, all the M's, that's the thing that's going to get you with your husband Jesus. That, that desire for whatever he had and for him to save us and rescue us sometimes had me on the bathroom floor at the job that I worked because I needed him that bad, and I couldn't even go to him standing up. And so I'd be on the bathroom floor at work, and then I'd have to pull myself together and go back out to the front desk to, to greet people. And I wouldn't trade a single minute of it. So welcome to the Riches of His Glory retreat. Uh, how many of you have problems? <laughs> All right. See, I like to start out on a really positive note. Um, I, I love to pump up the crowd right away with the hope and faith. And so today I'm going to start by talking about problems. And um, I'm going to tell you just a few of mine, a few of the problems I've had in my life, just so you don't think I'm up here because I don't have problems. In fact, most of the time when I'm up here, and Rhea and all the ladies from yesterday, Linda can attest, most of the time, I just had at least three big ones the week before I got here. All right, so um, some of the problems that I have faced in my years as an adult, I won't go back to the childhood, we don't have time for that, but um, I married a man with an addiction, and um, God put on my heart to have a large family, he wanted a large family, too. It was always a dream of mine to have a lot of children. And I thought, you know what? We're going to have the Waltons. We're going to have good night, John Boy, good night, Sue Ellen. It's just going to be precious. I homeschooled, you know. And about 12 years in, I was like, wrong TV show. How did we end up on Jerry Springer? <laughs> And I'm not even exaggerating. I mean, the police in the small town I lived in all knew me by my first name. And um, thankfully, they, we had a great relationship because I had to rely on them a lot. And um, at a certain point, I said, Lord, you know, you are the God of Plan B, right? So could I maybe just have the Jerry Walton show? Could we just do like a little hybrid thing? I mean, we're never going to be the Waltons, but could we get a little of that sweetness in there? 
And it's been um, quite a journey going through divorce with an addict. He was actually removed from our home by police one night when he attacked our oldest daughter. And my son, my third born son, who was a wrestler and a linebacker, actually saved her. And so I had two children. I wasn't home at the time. I had two children bruised and battered. And that was, as they say, the first day of the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, okay, you know, with God, every day is the first day of the rest of your life. And so the next day led into the single motherhood. And then uh, I met my second husband, Scott, who had one son. So we have a very discombobulated Brady Bunch. I had 11, he had one. And when we were dating and he'd introduce people to me and say, she has 11 kids, he's also like Linda, loves to see people's faces. So I'll just say it, to see people's faces. And men would say, um, he, they'd look right at him with me standing right next to him and say, dude, are you nuts? <laughs> and I would say, I'm standing right here. And he'd say, I don't care. Dude, are you nuts? <laughs> and uh, so I knew right away he was special. And we got married in 2011. And after years of trying to navigate loving an addict, all the anger, all the fear and all the follow of addiction and abuse in a home, raising up my children in that, my own issues with all of that, learning how to be the kind of mom that doesn't mind looking in the mirror because for many years I did not want to be in front of a mirror. I didn't like who was looking back at me. And learning how to begin here because this is the only person I can control as I began to navigate my children through teen years, through their own struggles, some with addictions, some rebellion, all kinds of things. And then I got remarried and thought, this is it, man. We are on our way. And then we got all the baggage of the second marriages and the stepdad and stepkids and the stepkids going, you're not my dad. And, you know, guys, it has not been easy. I've had a lot of problems. And um, I, I've often thought about, you know, problem solving as a skill and how when you're young, you just get through a problem. And if you have enough problems, you start to realize you don't just get through them. You figure out how to solve them and you come up with a plan. And then you poke holes in the plan before you implement the plan so that when you implement the plan, somebody else can't poke holes in the plan and ruin the plan. Okay. So I have become very good at problem solving over the years. And something that I never really thought about until a couple of years ago was that God also had problems. Did you guys know that God had problems? <laughs> Someone said yes, us. That's, that's very true. You know, that's a simple summation. Um, I was going to make it a little more deep, but yes, thank you. Um, when he would just, I want you to picture with me, I like to imagine, and this isn't in the Bible per se, but I like to imagine Father, Son, and Holy Spirit planning us, planning creation, and planning how they're going to do this, the earth, what it's going to look like, what they're going to put in it, how they're going to give man dominion, how they're going to make woman, and she's going to bring forth life just like her father. She's going to be a life giver. And then they get to the part where they're like, well, you know, if we let them make their own decisions, <laughs> pretty much like any parent of a teen, right? And they realize, and they know because he's the alpha and he's the omega. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows as soon as we factor in this free will thing, the entire thing is going south. And in that moment, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had two problems. Problem number one, we're all very familiar with, the problem of sin, right? What are we going to do when they sin? Not if. <laughs> what are, are we going to do when they sin? It's like a parent of a teen. What am I going to do when they screw up? Not if. Because they will. Because they're human. That's how God looks at us. And so what are we going to do when they sin? So that's problem number one, sin, what separates us from God. 
I love one definition of sin that goes like this. It's missing the mark. And I think that definition brings so much grace with it. And I think that that's how the Father looked at it. He said, what do we do when they miss the mark? They're going to miss the mark. And so we got to do something about the problem of sin because sin is what separates us from God. And he didn't make us to be separated from us. And if any of you have been estranged from one of your children, you know what I'm talking about. You did not bring them into the world to be separated from them. And that's how God felt about every single human being who would ever exist. I'm not going to make a single one just to be separated from them. So they knew they could solve the problem of sin and separation with the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus could atone for our sin, right? What about problem number two? Problem number two is what sin causes. It's the consequences of sin in this world. What are some of the consequences of sin? Feel free to shout at me. I'm a mom of 12. I can take it. What are some of the consequences of sin? Divorce. Disease. Jail. Death. Death. Yeah. Depression, emotional, emotional trauma, right? Anything else? Addiction, yeah. Division. Ooh, you, you girls are good. I hope you're speaking hypothetically and not from experience. I always hope that for women. Um, so, yes, those are all, and there are many more, consequences of sin. And so what God knew in his foresight, not only would sin separate us from him, sin would completely transform our experience in the world he created for us. He knew that there was going to be a really big problem for us when we came into this fallen world versus the world he intended for it to be. And the consequences of sin most easily seen in what happens to our bodies. Remember how he said to Adam and Eve, you will die if you eat of it? And before that, they were not scheduled to die. They were scheduled to live for eternity. But what happened immediately was breakdown in the body. So you can see in the physical body, sickness, disease, aging. Now you apply that breakdown to our mental health our emotional health, our financial health, our relational health. The very same process in the human body is the same process that happens in every area of our life. We start out okay, and it just gets worse. I told you I'd start with the good news, guys. <laughs> and so God is sitting there, God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And he says, we need to do something about both of these problems. It's not enough as a loving father for me to just know I can be with my children for eternity. I need to do something about their experience that I created for them. And this is where I believe the son raised his hand. And he said, I'll go. I'll do it. And actually, what I've learned about God is probably all three of them volunteered and thought about it. <laughs> because that's their love for us. I'll go. I'll do it. No, love me. No, no, no. You'll go later, Holy Spirit. They'll need you later. You'll be separated from the Father and Son later. And the Father said, well, then I'll be separated from the Son for a season. And they all chose to be separate from each other for us, for the separation you're feeling right now with the people that you love. You have a God that understands more than you will ever know. And so the son steps up and says, I will do it. And he says, my blood will cleanse them of all sin, and they can come near to me. My blood will be enough to remove the separation. Problem number one, check. Then he says this, my body will be broken for the brokenness they now experience in their bodies. 
Have you ever wondered why we take communion and we take the bread and we drink the cup and the only thing we ever talk about is the blood of Jesus? Have you ever wondered that? Have you also thought that both the body and the blood were for the forgiveness of our sin? Because that's not actually biblical. I'm going to show you this morning how absolutely perfect God's plan was from the beginning and how there's evidence of his plan that the body would be broken for our health to be healed and the blood would be shed for the forgiveness of our sins. It starts in Genesis and it goes all the way through. I'm going to read to you some scriptures this morning. Bear with me as I do. Um, I don't normally have a talk so heavy on scripture, but I feel compelled to make a case for my God today. I feel compelled to make a case for what Jesus did. I'll even go so far as to say, I think this is the most important message in the Bible. Not, not, that's not about me. That's about him. That if we don't grasp this, we are missing out on what he bled for, what he was beaten for, what he died for. And a long, long time ago, before I ever had this revelation, in fact, it was probably during those single mother days when I was on my face, I said, Lord, please let not one drop of your blood be shed in vain for this family. Not one drop. What I didn't know was that the brokenness that broke me was taken care of by his broken body. I was still thinking it all was about the blood, not knowing why he had to take those stripes. I'm going to show you today. I can't wait to show you how this begins. So in Genesis chapter 14, I just want to read you this story about the priest known as Melchizedek. He was the high priest. Many scholars and theologians believe he was pre-Jesus incarnate. And when he showed up on the scene, listen to what it says, starting in verse 17. It starts in verse 18. It says, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. The very first mention of bread and wine in the Bible was when the high priest Melchizedek showed up in the earth. It was always the plan to be both our savior and our healer, to be broken for our brokenness, and to die for our sin. How many of you need somebody to heal you of your brokenness? Amen. I never want to stop being healed of the brokenness I've experienced in my life. Then in Genesis chapter 12, actually this is um, not Genesis. I have the wrong thing in my notes. It's Passover. It's Exodus. Um, and, and we're going to fast forward to the very first Passover meal or what Jesus did with his disciples we know as the, the Last Supper. They were having Passover meal before Jesus went to the cross. This is the very first Passover meal. Listen to this. It says, The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defect. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day and the first month. Then you must slaughter their lamb. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides of the door frames of the houses where they eat. Blood on wood. What does that remind you of? The cross. And it goes on to say, and the death angel will pass over you because the blood on the cross spares us from the consequences of eternal death. But it goes on to say something really fascinating about the lamb. It says, that same night you must roast the meat over fire and eat it along with bitter greens and bread made without yeast. Do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the head, legs, and internal organs, must be roasted over fire. Do not leave any of it until the next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten before morning. Do you know what that means to me now? When I read that, younger, probably multiple times, I was just like, weird. That's what it meant to me, weird. So many instructions about water and fire and eating and organs, and it just seemed weird. But now I read that, and this is what I hear. That lamb's body that they ate of represents our Savior's body that we are privileged to eat of. 
And here's what I hear when it says, it all must be roasted over fire. The father was saying, my son is going to go down to the pits of hell for you. His entire being will be in the pits of hell, not just part of him. And he will go and he will take your punishment. And then he will take the keys of death and the grave from you, or from the enemy, over you. And then it goes on to say, do not eat it raw. No, no, no. This body must be burned. And do not boil it in water. This body must not be watered down. This broken body must never be watered down. You must never forget what Jesus did in his body. And I'm going to show you more in Isaiah. And then it says, every part, head, legs, internal organs, must be roasted over a fire. And don't leave any of it till the next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten. What he's saying is, don't waste it. Friends, don't waste what Jesus did for you. Can you imagine what maybe would have happened had they wasted some? I don't know, but I can tell you what happened when they obeyed. We fast forward to Psalm 105, verse 37, and there's this little verse with this powerful message hidden in the Psalms. It's not even in the story of the Exodus, but it says very clearly about the Israelites After they ate this Passover meal, here's what it says. He brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among them. There it is, tucked in the Psalms, that when they ate the lamb, they were healed. Listen, these guys were slaves, and they were having to meet a double quota because of Pharaoh's wrath against Moses and the Jews. They were having to do double the work in the same amount of time in the weeks and days leading up to this Passover meal. And they left Egypt on foot with not one people. Does that sound like a miracle to you? That sounds like a miracle to me. That sounds like even before, pre-Jesus, the eating of the lamb was for healing. There was not one feeble. That means they're elderly. They're disabled. They're sick or healed when they took the Passover meal. That is so exciting to me. Uh, Feeble here in this verse means to totter or waver through weakness, to falter, stumble, faint or fall, to be cast down, decayed, to fail, fall down, be ruined or be utterly weak. And nobody had any of that. When I think about my family, literally being delivered from a form of Egypt, a form of slavery. Oh, Jesus, let there be not one feeble among us. Let us be strengthened with the healing that only comes from your body. In Isaiah 33, 24, it says this about the future Israel. That's us. It says, and the inhabitant will not say, I am sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. Wait a minute, why is sickness and iniquity mentioned together in the scripture? Because the cross was always meant to forgive and to heal. The body and the blood. The body and the blood solved both problems. Psalm 103, 2 through 5, we know this one. It's a song. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. There it is again. All throughout the word of God, forgiveness and healing go hand in hand. And we, you know, we struggle with forgiveness, right? We struggle with that. We struggle to forgive ourselves. But we figure it out. We need to do the same thing for our healing. We need to apprehend the promise of God and get this truth in our hearts until we have health. And not just health, divine health. Jeremiah 17, 14 says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Jeremiah the prophet prophesied of what would happen on the cross right there. And then, of course, the infamous Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 5, that prophesied of the Messiah's death. And it says, surely our griefs he himself bore, in verse 4. Griefs in that scripture means sicknesses, weaknesses, distresses, and sadness. Whoever yelled depression, that's your good news today. 
He bore your sadness on the cross. What does it mean to bear, or where it says he himself bore? It means to carry, to take away, to endure, to carry off, to forgive, to be swept away. Pick one, pick three, pick all of them, and picture him doing that with your sickness, your disease, and your sadness. Because that's what he did on the cross. It goes on to say, Um, And our sorrows he carried. In this scripture, our sorrows literally means all physical pain and all mental pain. All physical pain and all mental pain. He carried literally means to make one's self the burden. Let's read this verse again in light of that meaning. Our physical and mental pain he became. So we don't have to experience it in this life. We will experience it, but he wants to deliver us from it. Amen? I can't take it anymore when people say, well, the Lord brought the cancer because he knew that I would trust him more. He knew that I'd be on my face and, you know, in utter fear because that's what a loving God does? Or let's put it how it really is. The Father allowed the Son to come and do that, but then the Father is going to sit No, we cannot allow this false teaching anymore. It's it's a travesty to me that my Jesus is up there getting blamed for disease when he went to these lengths to deal with it, to to put a checkbox next to the problem. We have to spread the word, my friends. We have to tell people everything he died for, not just a ticket to heaven, Can you imagine having your children be raised and just letting them suffer their whole life and saying, well, you know, as long as I can be with them later, it's all good. No, no, a loving parent doesn't do that. Um, I discovered this verse in Proverbs that I thought was so beautiful here. Um, I'm still in, in Isaiah if you're there with me, but... Let me interject this after the verse I just read and our sorrows he carried. Listen to this proverb. It says, The blessing of the Lord brings true riches, and he adds no sorrow to it. What's the blessing of the Lord based on this message today? Health? The cross, right? The cross is the blessing of the Lord. If we can apply the cross of Christ, we cannot be more blessed. We could not be more blessed. And it says here in Proverbs that the blessing of the Lord brings true riches. The theme of this retreat is the riches of his glory. We have no greater riches than the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus because he solved every problem we ever faced. Mental, physical, emotional, financial, relational. I'm going to keep showing you that in a minute. It says then in the next scripture in Isaiah, yet we ignorantly considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God as if with leprosy. Isn't that how he was treated as a leper, worse than a leper as a criminal? Then it goes on to say, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. Pierced through. Listen to this. I mean, this one hits home. Not only did we have abuse in our home, but um, I learned when my daughter, my second oldest child, was in college, she called me one night to tell me uh, that when she was eight years old, a family member molested her. Pretty much a mom's worst nightmare, right? I told you guys I've had some problems. And when I read this, I wanted to hear this from that perspective. What, what someone did, a trusted family member, a grown-up adult male, what he did to my daughter. To be pierced through means to be defiled, polluted, dishonored, violated, and profaned. I sat with that scripture and I thought, if Jesus did that, then we don't have to suffer because what a man did. And if Jesus did that to heal my daughter, then he did that to heal her perpetrator too. He didn't just take on the defilement and the pollution and the violation and the profanity of the victim. (coughs) He took it from the perpetrator as well and for the perpetrator. Listen, we got to get past 
this place where we cannot let go of abuse and violation because Jesus took it all. He took your worst enemy's depravity and he was torn apart for that. So what are we saying to him when we say, I can't, I can't let go, I can't, I can't. How many of you say, well, I'm on a forgiveness journey. I'm just not there yet, okay? I get that a lot when I minister to women. I'm, I'm on the journey. I'm just not all the way there yet. Well, let me just tell you this. Forgiveness is not a journey. It's a decision. It's not a journey. It's a decision. And the same way that we struggle to forgive wicked, evil people, we struggle to forgive ourselves. Can I just tell you that's a decision, too? Just stop trying to overrule the one who says you weren't forgiving and just be grateful. Okay, let it go. I won't bust into song. I'm not really a fan of Disney anyway. But just let it go, okay? Agree with the one who said you're worth forgiving. Not because you're so great, because he's so great. Not because you've sacrificed enough, because he's sacrificed enough. Can we let ourselves off the hook? In fact, maybe the reason you can't let go of that offense with that person is because you're still holding on. You can't give away what you don't have. Start here. I remember hearing a message that forgiving yourself is so selfish. And it's so this like worldly thing. The Bible doesn't say to forgive yourself. Well, that's true. One day I was on my treadmill and I was praying my craft of prayer, and I knew enough to pray the pieces of the Lord's Prayer that, that the Lord's Prayer is a recipe, not something to be recited but something to understand and pray. So when it gets to the part where it says, forgive uh, my debts as I forgive those uh, who are indebted to me, I was like, okay, I got to that part, and I said, okay, Lord, uh, who do I need to forgive? I've also learned that where it says in Jeremiah that the heart of man is wicked and deceitful above all else, who can know it, I can't trust myself to answer the question of who should I forgive today? Because I would be like, nobody, I'm good. And then the Lord would like, tell me ten names. Okay? <laughs> and so I learned to say, who do I need to forgive today to have the right heart? And he said, yourself. And I was like, first of all, I thought of that sermon. I'm like, Lord, is that biblical? <laughs> I was like, well, it must be because he's saying it. And so I said, okay, I'll forgive myself. And so I forgave myself. And I was like, that was interesting. Never did that before. And then the next day, I prayed again. And I said, Lord, who do I need to forgive today? And he goes, and I'm like, uh, I just did that yesterday. And he said, yeah, but then last night. And I immediately knew what he meant. Don't you love how he can download? He can say one thing, and then six things. Coming to my, and I saw myself laying in bed, recounting everything I did wrong that day. And I, I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I took a little fence with myself again last night. I forgive him. And then I said, Lord, what do I need to forgive and release myself for? And he said, what do you hold against yourself the most? And I knew immediately what I needed to say. I said, I forgive myself for being human, flawed, and imperfect. Something I can do nothing about. Something he decided was okay with him, but somehow it's not okay with and so I said, I forgive myself for being human, flawed, and imperfect. I release myself on any debt I'm, I'm holding against me. Next day, same thing. I pray the prayer. I get to the forgiveness part. I said, Lord, who do I need to forgive today? And he said, yourself. And I fell on the floor. I was standing, and I fell on my face on the floor. And I said, yeah. And I instantly realized that Probably since I was about 10 years old, every day I ended my day by rehearsing all of my failure. And I realized that the night before, I got the ledger book out again, and I started writing down all of my debts. And that's when I realized I do this every day, and I've done this for decades. And if I don't deal with this, I will never the call of God, and I will never walk in my true identity. I will always 
be silently punishing me. And when I sit with this verse that talks about the defilement he took, the pollution he took, the dishonor he took, how he said, I'll be violated so you can be free. I'll be profaned so you can be pure. How could I do that to him? How can I do that to him anymore? Let it go. Take his forgiveness. If he says, it's yours for the taking, take it then you can freely give it away. When it says that he was pierced for our transgressions, that word transgressions there means fault, offense, crime, rebellion, sin. Is this hitting home for anybody yet? Um, Trespasses against individuals, trespasses against a nation, and trespasses against God. He was pierced. For every way you would violate anyone, ever. And when you think about trespasses against a nation, with the division in our world, with racism, and um, just people groups hating people groups, I'm so glad he listed that in there. That even when we transgress a people group, think about the hatred the Jews have received. Jesus died for all the people that would hate his people. He died for all the people that would hate you. And then it goes on to say he was crushed for our iniquities. Crushed means broken, shattered. To be made contrite, which means broken and bruised. How many of you have been contrite in your life? So was he. So that you could be healed. It also means to be deeply afflicted with grief and sorrow for having offended God. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin. He became an offense to his father so that his father didn't have to be offended by us. Are we understanding what was done for us? Are we applying this to our lives? Do you know yesterday, last night, Rhea talked about DTR, to find the relationship with Jesus. Today, it's time to DTR your relationship with the cross. We are all about Jesus. We love him. Do we even understand our relationship with the cross? What was done there? It's like a giant gift wrapped in the most beautiful wrap and was placed on every one of our doorsteps. And we all just scooch it out of the way to leave our home. We never bring it in and we never open it. Today, God wants you to bring it in and open it and receive the healing and the wholeness that Jesus died to give you. Lastly, it says, uh, the chastising for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. We've all heard it. By his stripes, you were healed. By his stripes, you were healed. What does that even mean? When I was a little girl, I used to wonder, why did Jesus have to get beaten? I mean, I got why he had to die. Somebody's got to die for all the bad things in the world, right? That made sense to me as a kid. And all the talk was about the blood of Jesus. So I was like, in my little kid logic, going, well, when they put the nails in him, he bled. Why wasn't that enough? Why did he have to be so tormented? and so beaten in his body. And I discovered the reason right here in Isaiah 53, verse 5. It says in the transliteration of Hebrew, it means he was torn apart so we could be mended. He was torn apart worse than any of us will ever be torn apart so that we can take that and allow it to mend the places where we are torn in our own lives. When it says that the chastisement for our well-being was on him, I want you to understand that word well-being, which is also the word peace, means completeness, soundness. It means welfare. That means you're well cared for. It means completeness in number. Listen, if there's a, a prodigal in your family, Jesus died to make your number whole again, to bring that one home. He died for our safety, soundness in body. This is all still the definition of our well-being. Soundness in our body, welfare, health, prosperity. Peace, 
quiet tranquility, contentment for peace in relationship with both God and man. He died for your relationships. He died for your contentment. He died for your provision. There is not one area of your life that he was not torn apart for. Not one. And lastly, the Hebrew word shalom actually means nothing missing, nothing broken. Historians tell us that when he was scourged, whole pieces of flesh and and fascia muscle tissue were pulled from his frame and internal organs were exposed. The Bible says he was unrecognizable, whether human or not. Okay, we don't even know how bad it was. But I can tell you why he did it. So that you would have nothing missing, nothing broken. And lastly, where it says, by his stripes we are healed, it means to mend by stitching. Oh, Father, come and stitch us up today. The root word for mend actually imitates the sound of a person sewing rapidly. Can I tell you, he wants to sew you back together rapidly today. He wants to touch your health. He wants to touch your relationships, your finances, your mind. That mind, ooh, it's a crazy place up there, right? Just speaking for me. No judgment, ladies. Just speaking for me. He died for that. It says uh, that healed means to repair thoroughly, to make whole. Now listen to this. Healed of national hurts. There's hope for our country. Healed of individual distresses. Oh man, okay. If distresses come in correlation with the number of children, I have the most distresses in the room, I think. I need Jesus for my distresses. Healing a wounded person by sowing the wound to heal a person, a people, a land. It's so beautiful what he did. He left no stone unturned to make healthful. Listen to this one. To restore pristine felicity. Who is in line for some pristine felicity? I will be as soon as I look that up in the dictionary. To heal disease or sickness, to restore the favor of a nation, to be healed personally, to be healed nationally. Has he left anything out so far, my friends? Not a thing. We have got to stop accepting brokenness and bruised conditions as our normal. We have to stop thinking, oh, I just can't wait to go to heaven so I can be done with all this. We can have heaven here. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit sat down and they solved the two problems that would be created when they gave man free will. But we do not apply the solution to our lives. How many of you are ready to apply the solution to your life today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And then we know that Jesus goes on and he breaks bread in the Last Supper. And he says to them, let me back up here. He says to them, and while they were eating, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. He broke it just before he went to have his body broken. And he says, take and eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup. And he gave thanks. And then he said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. There again, we see both the body broken for healing, the blood for the forgiveness of sins. One last thing I want to share with you about communion is some of the religious teaching that we have around it that is um, incorrect. We're told not to take communion in an unworthy manner. Well, honey, then you'd have to wait till you get to heaven to take communion, okay? And ain't nobody got time for that. We need communion now. We need it yesterday, okay? And so I want to talk to you about this scripture in 1 Corinthians 11, where it says um, not to take communion in an unworthy manner. Listen, Paul is talking about the manner in which you take it, not whether you are worthy or unworthy. There is a difference between unworthy
worthy and doing something in an unworthy manner. And if you read those scriptures in context, you see that they were showing up to church and some of them were eating so much bread that it was gone before other people got to the table and some were drinking so much wine they were drunk. And Paul, um, I'm going to do it in the KJK version, he was like, do you guys have kitchens? Have you heard of DoorDash? He was like, eat at home. This is what he was saying. He's like, you guys, this is not a buffet. It's the Lord's Supper. This is the honorary manner with which they were eating it. Then he goes on to say, you eat it and drink it to your judgment because you do not discern the body. He's correcting them. Not about the blood, the body. What does that mean? If you don't discern what the body was broken for, and you just take communion clueless, guess what judgment you have on you? Not judgment from God. You remain under the curse of this world, the curse of sickness and death. He was like, you guys discern the body. And then he goes on to say, this is the reason why some of you sleep and are sick. And sleep there means dying too soon. He's saying, this is the reason some of you are dying early and are sick in your body, because you're not discerning the body. You're taking communion like it's a snack, and you're missing the yacht that's right in front of you. That's what Paul is saying in this scripture. And that's my challenge to you today, to take communion from this day forward in a worthy manner, meaning understanding what you're agreeing with. See, it's not the power of the bread or the power of the juice. It doesn't matter what you're drinking. I've heard testimonies of a very, very ill woman who was hospitalized for three years. And she was on a limited diet, and the only thing she had available for the articles of communion were the pills she had to swallow and the water she swallowed them with. And so she took her pill and she took her water and said, I agree with the body of Jesus and I agree with the blood of Jesus. And she was healed. It's not about the bread and the cup. It's about what you're agreeing with. It's that you're activating your faith and saying, I get it now and I want it now. How many of you get it now and you want it now? Amen. I've been taking communion almost every day since 2020. In fact, when um, COVID came around is when I really began to study this and got a revelation. And I knew, I knew that this was my safety. This was my divine health. You see, there's a lot of things we can do for health in this life. God gave us a lot of green plants and herbs and oils, and he gave us water to drink, and he gave us sleep at night. And he gave us muscles that we can move. Those things help us with health, but there's only two things that give us divine health. The body and the blood of Jesus. Rio, will you, will you hop up here for a minute? Um, before we take you in, because we're going we're gonna to apprehend this today, amen, we're going to get a hold of what Jesus got a hold for us. But I want to read and share a testimony. So I had no idea of this story until yesterday, and she had no idea what I was speaking of. But when we chatted yesterday, I said, i got to get you up here. So will you share your testimony of communion? Can we just thank this dear thing? I have just been so blessed by her teaching. She, she wants you to get this. This is real. It's real. Everything he died for, he did for you. Uh, he is the prince of our pieces. When, when she said the word wholeness, the word peace means wholeness. It means nothing missing and nothing broken. I was ministering in, um, in Florida a number of years ago, and I was speaking about the prince of peace. And some woman came up to me afterwards, and she said, that thing you said about peace, nothing missing, nothing broken, you don't know how broken my, my life is, but when you said that, the Lord said, I want to be the prince of your pieces. I want to put you back together again. And, and that's what Kim so brilliantly uh, just said to you. And, and so he died so that we could be whole. The punishment that brought us peace, wholeness, was upon him on the cross of Calvary. And he suffered so that we could be whole. I don't, I don't want to miss anything that he died for me to have. And 
So Kim wanted me to tell you the story yesterday when I uh, saw her. I said, Kim, tell me what you're teaching. And she told me, and, and it, just, uh, it just blessed my heart so much. And I said, I believe wholly what you're teaching. And uh, a number of years ago, I was diagnosed with a um, squamous cell carcinoma on my forehead. It was a tumor. You could see it. But I had had tons of skin cancer removed. It's really nothing. And I knew that. And so I went to the dermatologist, and she removed it. And uh, she called me a couple days later when the biopsy came back, and she said, Rhea, could you come in? And I'm like, well, normally you just tell me what it is over the phone. And, and she said, yeah, but we'd like you to come in. And so I knew it was something serious, and, but it was still skin cancer. What's the big deal? And, and so I went into her office, and she scooted her chair up next to me, and she put her hand on my leg, and she said, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, so sorry. She said, yes, the, the squamous cell carcinoma it invaded the nerve. In your, in your forehead, and it won't be long before it spreads throughout your body. And, and she said, we need to get you in and have that tumor removed, and she said, you'll have to go through some radiation treatments, but she said, even with the radiation, uh, the cancer will reappear somewhere in your body, and, and she said, it's really not a good prognosis, Rhea. And I thought, I am not coming in to agreement with that. Amen. Christ died so that I could be whole. And I had been, been reading about communion. I had been studying about communion uh, during that time. And so I decided, I said to my husband, we're not even going to tell anybody about this. They scheduled an appointment for me to go in to a Mohs surgeon and have this tumor removed. And I was scheduled to begin radiation treatment the next day. And so uh, I began to use that time between the dermatologist appointment and the appointment with the Mohs surgeon, and I took communion every single day. And when I did, when I took that bread in my mouth, I said, Lord, you were broken so that I could be whole. That's right. Cancer is not making me whole. I, I, I'm declaring and decreeing as I take that bread that, that I'm going to be whole in Jesus' name. When I, when I took the wine, I said, Lord, thank you that the blood of Jesus is purifying my body from any cancer cells. And in the name of Jesus, I receive what you did on the cross of Calvary. And I, I am receiving everything. I am not going to receive this cancer diagnosis. And I know for some of you, you think that's crazy. But for me, it was real. I was studying this stuff. I don't know about you, but I believe everything. Every word, every word of this book, every word. And, and so uh, the day came for me to go into the doctor, and you could see the, the tumor. It was definitely there. I had the lab report that said it was squamous cell uh, perineural invasion, and, and it was not a good prognosis. And the, the doctor that I saw that day I had never seen before, he was a Hindu man, and he came in and kind of patted my hand, and he was really sorry for this diagnosis. And they were going to take the tumor and, and then go look at it under the microscope and make sure that they got clean margins. And he said, we'll probably have to cut several times. And, and so he, he, he measured the tumor, he had his nurse documented, and they took pictures of it, and he made the first incision, and he left with that tumor and he went out to look under the microscope. And my husband was with me and we said, we just want you to know, doctor, that we're Christians and that we are believing that God is going to heal us. And he chuckled. He chuckled. And I said, Lord, don't leave yourself without a testimony. Amen. And so he took that tumor and he went and looked at it under the microscope and he came back about 20 minutes later and I have this gash in my head. You know, he has a, 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 a bandage on it and he came back and, and his face was white. And, and he said, Rhea, I just need to tell you, he said, I, I don't find any evidence of perineural invasion in, in your tumor. And he said, as a matter of fact, I see no cancer at all in, your, in this tumor. And, and he said, you know, you don't need this radiation treatment. We can cancel those appointments. And he said, but I am going to take what we call an insurance layer. And he said, we're going to send it out to Mayo Clinic because he said, I have a, I have a lab report here saying that you have perineural invasion and I'm seeing something different. And he said, I have to cover my back. And, and he said, but the bad news is when I, when I cut this next layer, it's going to hit some facial nerves. And he said, you're going to lose feeling. Uh, over over your your head and he said you're, you're not going to get that feeling back and I thought Lord you did not do this to now give me nerve nerve damage and so sure enough when he cut it and I'm not exaggerating it was like a wave went back over my head and I lost all feeling uh, it, it was tingling all through my head and he said and that will be permanent and I thought Lord 
I, I'm just not going to receive that. But at any rate, I left his office that day, and we had canceled a vacation because I was supposed to have these uh, radiation treatments. And my husband said, well, let's go on vacation. And so we stopped by our church to, to pick up our work on the, way, on the way out of town because we decided we would still go. And a pastor, a friend of ours, saw me. And we haven't told anybody about this tumor. And so she saw me with this big bandage on my forehead. And she said, Ray, what happened? And I told her the story. And she said, God did not heal you of cancer to give you nerve damage. And she put her hand on my forehead and she began to just pray right over me. Ten minutes later. I'm not exaggerating. The Lord is my witness. Ten minutes later, I got complete feeling back to, back to my head. I'm telling you what Kim preached to you today is real. Don't leave here. She, she laid it out for you as brilliantly as anyone I've ever seen. Don't leave here with whatever is dogging you, with whatever is, is, is come upon your life and the enemy has used to bring glory to himself and take it from God. I'm telling you, don't leave here this weekend the same. She preached truth. It works. The punishment that brought you peace, wholeness, prosperity was upon him on the cross of Calvary. Don't cheat him out. Yes. Of anything that he accomplished for you on that cross. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It would take me too long to share the many miracles I've had since I've applied this truth to my life and I've been taking communion regularly financial, relational, physical, emotional. And I want to just go on record and say this is my promise from God. He said, I grew up um, diagnosed with asthma at the age of eight, and, and lung stuff has kind of plagued me my whole life. And what the Lord told me was, your lungs will be as if they were never afflicted, your emotions will be as if they were never wounded, and your finances will be as if they were never stolen. That's your promise. And that is my agreement when I take the bread and the cup every day. And I take it for them kids, because Lord knows with 12, you're going to have a couple of prodigals in there, right? And I just say, too bad, you're marked. I take the body and the blood every day for you. I got you. You're coming home. The shepherd's going to come and get you. He's going to leave the 99, which is what our family functions feel like. And he's going to go, and he's going to get the one in Jesus' name. Before we take communion, you all, um, the ushers, you can go ahead and come forward and, and give the elements of and I want to show you something. Can you guys see the light shining through this? This is a Jewish matzah bread. And what's so amazing about this is this is their unleavened bread. And you can see with the light shining through that it's pierced. You can see the marks on it that it's striped. Do you see the stripes on the bread? And you can see the scorch marks where it was burned. And you can see in a, in a cracker, it isn't a cracker, it's a prophetic symbol of the Savior that Jewish rabbis bless all the time. It's a picture of Jesus. I wonder if they have thought about why it's pierced and striped and has fire marks. Because our Lord was pierced and striped and went to the fires of hell for me and for you. So this morning, I want you to be thinking about what is the brokenness that you want to apply his stripes to. And there's no wrong answer, and there's no list to want. You want to get out your notes and literally write it down in your notebook. You go ahead. Today, we're going to say, Lord, there's no brokenness too big for you to heal. Because we know now you found everything. Spiritual separation from God, emotional brokenness, mental brokenness, relational brokenness, financial brokenness. Ladies, poverty was never the will of God for the earth. You know how I can say that wholeheartedly? Because if you want to see God's heart for his kids, you look at the garden before sin and you look at heaven. 
encourage you all to do the same, to persist and take hold of that which was taken hold of for you. Amen. Who's going to persist with me? Amen. God bless you, ladies. You're such a joy. Thank you so much.